walking up close. No, they're not booing. That's Luke they're cheering for. And you couldn't tell the difference between the crowd here, Luke, and that game there against... <laughs> that was the first time you guys had taken a lead in the playoffs in, since 1998. I mean, the droughts of losing streaks. How big was that goal and how much of a factor was that in knocking off the wings? At the time, I don't know if, you know, it was a factor because we won that game, but uh, at the time, we knew how important it was to get a lead and we wanted to get a lead and, uh, you know, it was just, I, I was just laughing because I saw myself jump all over the place. I'm like, what was I thinking? You know? But uh, it just, we were, I was just so happy. We were all so happy because we knew how important it was to get a lead because Every game in the playoffs is a one-goal game, so if you can get a lead, you, you, a lot of times you'll end up winning the game. What changed in that series? The Wings had dominated so much. They hadn't lost at home since last year, really. What, why did the tenor of that series change? I think the big thing for us is the first two games, we showed them too much respect. We were so worried about them. I mean, we were trying to play off of what they were doing. And then suddenly we, we, we got back home and... Uh, we had a few talk, you know, the, the day before, and uh, and then when, when we got to the game, we just said, you know what, let's just go play our game. Let's just, uh, the reason we made the playoffs, we had played like 24 games where we were in a playoff mode before the playoffs, you know, and and it was our four check-in and the way we worked hard, and, and then from then on, we just did that. And uh, we won four straight games, and just by, by, you know, outworking them, that's basically what we did. Can you feel as you're feeling here from the audience and all the Luke Robitaille jerseys we see here and what happened with the largest crowds ever at a California hockey game as the momentum built. How different is it these days to be an LA King? Oh, it's been, it's been incredible. I mean, I was just telling uh, some friends of mine the other day and I said, I've never seen this. In 93, when we went to the finals and people got excited, I mean, it was, it was amazing. But nothing like this year. This year, within the first round, people were going crazy. And, there's not a place I go right now that either people thank me. <laughs> they go, thank you guys, thank you. Not just me, the whole team. You know, they're thanking us for, for what we did this year or they just think it was the greatest year ever. And I think the big thing is we were underdogs and guys really worked hard. And, and uh, you can really tell right now hockey's on the map in L.A. So it's, 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 it's been a lot of fun for that. I mean, like I said, I've never seen that in L.A. I mean, every restaurant I go, everywhere I go, people honk their horns. They're like, great, great series. I'm like, what's going on? <laughs> Is life better then? Oh, it's, 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 uh, it's amazing. Yeah. I would think it is, yeah. Uh, we talked about what changed the Detroit series. What changed for the Kings? I mean, this is a team that wasn't going to make the playoffs, and then suddenly you come within a game of getting in the conference finals. Yeah. And it kind of ironically, you know, Rob Blake, the tears, how can we yeah. trade this guy? And then right around that time, and then you also get Felix Potvin. I mean, how big a factor was that in the way you guys turned the season around? I think, no doubt, the biggest factor was Felix Potvin. I mean, I think if you look at the way we played the whole year, we were playing well. We were giving up between 20 and 25 shots every night, and it just... For some reason, it wasn't working out, and then we got Felix, and as a team, we just, we, we, I don't know why, but we were more confident, and things just went, it snowballed from there. And at the same time, I think, you know, the Rob trade uh, was, a, was a tough trade for everybody, for both sides, because, uh, you know, Adam Denmarsh and Aaron Miller were real popular players in Colorado, but... The way I feel about it is if you're going to trade Ron Blake where you're going to lose him at the end of the year, where you're going to lose him for nothing. If the team wasn't going to sign him, which we thought they were going to sign him, but we certainly got great players for them, for, for him. I mean, and I thought it was a great trade. But I think the biggest thing for us at the time is we didn't know what was going to happen. When, you, when the whole team is, you know, you never know what's going to happen. Is there going to be somebody in the trade? Is Rob going to stay? Is Rob going to go? And we wanted him to stay because we love him so much. He's, you know, he's a great player, too. But then finally when it happened, then we knew where we stood. We just knew what was going to Now we knew there was no more trade. We knew that was our team. And then we were able to settle down and, and, and play. Plus, we knew losing him, we had to play better as a team or we weren't going to win any games, and we did that. The L.A. Times quoted around the trade, and you guys are very tight, go back a long way yeah. with the L.A. Kings, that there were tears rolling down Rob's face in the oh, hotel yeah. lobby. Your eyes were misting. Yeah. How emotional it was, was it for you? It was really hard. I mean, uh, to tell you the truth, I never thought he would be traded. That was my belief inside. I never thought he would be traded, but that's the way it goes in our business. You know, such, you know there's different situations for every player. And, and when it happened, and, and you know, it was really hard that day. It was really hard, but... Then we had to move on. I wished him the best, and I wished him, I hope he's going to win the Cup. That's what I told him after, after they beat us. But uh, at the time, it was, a, it was a tough day. 
how complicated, how difficult did that make facing the avalanche then with the cross breeding of Dead Marsh and Miller on your team and facing Rob Blake? I think it was a lot harder for for Rob than it was for us because us were all together. You know, we're like 18 or 19 guys that were still together and him, like I think he, he just was like on the other side. So I think for him, it was really hard at the beginning, but, uh, and I, you know, to, to his uh, credit, I mean, he, he responded incredible. I mean, I think it was really hard, uh, you know, some of the, the booze in, in L.A. I told them later that I think they were just saying Luke, but <laughs> you know, right. I mean, uh, you know I, I think, he, but he handled it like a professional. He went out there, he never said anything negative, he just kept working hard, and he understood the situation. The fans were behind us, and they were trying to get something going, but, you know, he, ended, he handled it great, and he's played unbelievable since, too. You're not supposed to beat the Red Wings. You overcome getting swept by them the year before. Then you face Colorado, the team that dominates your conference. 1-1, going to the third period of Game 7. How long will that take to get over losing in Game 7? Uh, I mean, it, it's been hard. I mean, it, it's been hard. But to one sense, we feel like we, we worked really hard and, you know, we, you know, we accomplished something nobody expected. On the other side, I feel like we were one post away from being playing now, you know, playing, you know, for sure in the next series because I feel like Brian Smolinski hit the post at the end of the second. We just scored to make it 1-1 and Brian just hit the post and like this much and, and, and you know, and it's 2-1. I, I believe going in the third or four up 2-1, to we win the game. There's no doubt. It's just that then they ended up scoring 2-1 and we opened up a little bit because you want to win and uh, then they got, a you know, one goal and that was pretty much game over, especially the way that series was played. I mean, every game was a one-goal game. Yeah, well, it was an epic series, and they came that close. It was a, been an incredible story for the L.A. Kings, and we continue with Luke Robitaille. We'll get his take on what happens for the Avalanche from here on out. We'll also get his stories of sheep herding, and we'll take him back through history, including his influence on this record-setting goal. Right side of McSorley, back in front of Gretzky, he scores! Yeah, record book is now complete. He's the all-time leader in points, assists, and now with his 800-second goal, the all-time leading goal scorer in the history of the National Hockey League. Jansen is getting away, they block a lot of shots. Gretzky to Robitaille, scores! On the setup from the great one, Luke Robitaille with one of his 590 goals all time amongst left wingers in the NHL. Only Bobby Hull has more and Luke is closing in. He's just 20 goals away. 63 of those goals came Luke in 1993 with Wayne Gretzky, the time that the Kings, the only time they made it to the finals. When you left the first time with the L.A. Kings, a lot has been written about the tension that eventually existed. You were the king, and then Wayne came to town and changed hockey. And How is your relationship today with Wayne Gretzky? Oh, it's great. I mean, uh, let me correct something. Wayne is the king. <laughs> <laughs> Wayne Gretzky is Wayne Gretzky. I mean, there's nobody that's near him. I think in any sport, if you look st statistically, I mean, what he's done, it's incredible. But uh, the, our relationship was great. When I played with him in New York, we had a great time. We really did. I mean, it was a great experience for me, and uh, you know, and uh, it was sad to see him leave the game. But I think he's going to do some a great job in Phoenix. Yeah. How do you think he'll do in that role? I think really good. I mean, I think right now they're in a situation they're trying to get a new building. But uh, Phoenix is a great hockey town, and Wayne Wayne knows the game. I mean, you know, he's a you know, he knows the ins and outs of the game, and he knows tons of people. So I, I, have, I have a feeling once they get that new building, they'll put a winner there. Do you ever allow yourself to have the imagination of what if, you know, you were supposed to be united with Mario Lemieux, the other great one of this era in Pittsburgh, and Mario was out with complications from Hodgkin's yeah. and with his back problems. Do you ever think about we should have played at least uh, one year together? I certainly would have loved to play with a player like that, too. I mean, it's... Uh, He's a great player, and uh, it was just a situation. It just didn't happen uh, because the lockout. I was able to file for arbitration. At the time, Howard Baldwin was the owner. He talked to me. He says, you know, if you do that, I, I won't be able to afford to pay you. But unfortunately, there's a business out of our game, and he was, it was, he was real honest with me, and he, and, you know, he moved me to a team that that, that he, he thought would be a good fit for me at the time, and. Uh, it was, a, it was a good situation for me there, but, uh, you know, certainly I wish I would have had the opportunity to play with him. You know, he's, certainly, he's an amazing player, too. One of the reasons besides his illness that he went away from the ice was it got too physical. He wasn't allowed to be Mario Lemieux. 
Now he comes back, and he really had a physical series with the Devils that they just lost out on last night. Let me take you to a moment with him and John Madden. How uncharacteristic. <laughs> what got into Mario? I saw that. <laughs> and I read his quote today. He said he was laughing at him. So I don't know what Madden said to him. You see him turn around and say something, and he, he was a little bit frustrated. Uh, you could tell. <laughs> I, don't know, I don't know what happened, but I'd like to know what he said to make him that mad. You know, that's, that's a Mario. I used to watch him in junior, and I used to see... When guys used to watch him in junior where, where we grew up, I used to go see him and uh, guys would just follow him and never even try to play the puck, just follow him constantly. So he, he had to do those things. I don't know what happened there, there yesterday, but I was shocked when I saw it. Okay, you can't get into his head. I want to get into your head. Okay. <laughs> Chris Chelios is one of the meanest guys in the league. <laughs> uh, take it back to March against the Red Wings. It Chelios was, uh, said well, he couldn't understand what got into you. Why would you take on Chris Chelios? Well, we, you know, he's just one of those guys that plays really hard, and uh, he just he plays the game. He plays the game mean. He plays it dirty. And you know, I felt the first time that he he dropped his glove on me, he just looked at me, and I felt he sucker punched me. He just he just started he started punching me without me having time to take off my glove. So I figured, you know what, I'm not going to take it that way. I better go back and 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 stand out. That's it. You know, I mean, I respect him. I would love to have a guy like that on my team. I mean, he's one of the greatest player of all time, and. And he battles every single night, and you know that's that's what makes him great. And uh, it, it was uh, I got a lot of guys laughed about that one after that, that's for sure. How how at home are you in L.A.? Your best years were here before. You didn't have your best years in Pittsburgh or New York, and you come back and you had your best year in eight years this year. I uh, I feel very comfortable here. I, you know the the whole situation you know when, when I when I got here or you know it, they I they knew what to expect from me and uh, you know things have just been it seemed like they've, they've gone the right way here and uh, you know I mean in Pittsburgh things went well it was just a lockout year and uh, in New York it was just sometimes there's situations you know like a you know it just didn't work out and then when I got back here even the first year like you know in, in New York too I got injured for two years in a row which I had never gotten injured before in my eight years in L.A. And then in New York for two years I was injured. And then I got back here my first year in L.A. I was injured before I missed, I think it was 25 games. And then after that, you know, I worked real hard off the ice. And since then, you know, I've been, knock on wood, I've been lucky. I haven't gotten hurt. But uh, that's, that's really what it comes down to, you know. Injuries has a lot to do with the way you game. Let me talk about another connection who's back in California now, Bruce McDowell, the yeah. former owner of the Kings. Yeah. You went to visit him with Rob Blake oftentimes <laughs> when he was in prison for fraud charges in Michigan. Now he's out. You're telling me he looks a lot different oh, than this today. I, I just see that on TV now. He's lost 100 pounds. I mean, you wouldn't recognize him now. It's funny to see him that big. He's just like a, he's worked real hard. He's been working out for years now. <laughs> and the food has changed a little bit. No, but he's doing really good. He's trying to get back, you know, get his life back. And, uh, you know, the way I feel about him is he was a good man. He did a lot of great for hockey. He was always really good for us, the players. He treated us great. I, in many, many ways, he changed the game. I mean, because of him, there's a team in Anaheim, those teams in Florida, and probably a team in Dallas. It was all him that did that. And... And he admits his fault. For me, the biggest thing is he admitted, to, you know, he knows he's made some mistakes and, uh, and he's certainly paid for them. And uh, he's a good man, though. Like, he, you know, he certainly is entertaining and I love to talk to him. He's, he's one of my good friends. Well, it's great to see that that friendship yeah. goes on despite the hardships that he's gone through. And we continue with Luke Robitaille. We'll take him to his home life. To the kids playing hockey, will they follow in his footsteps? Stephen and Jesse will also talk about his wife Stacia's singing career up close. Thursday, we're back with you on Friday with Lisa Leslie and Michael Cooper of the L.A. Sparks to get you ready for this weekend's tip-off of the WNBA season, including their opener with Houston. We'll also discuss the team's decision to openly market to L.A.'s lesbian community, the Sparks, Friday at 5.30 Eastern. As we watch Luke upstairs practicing his shot, your questions are next. Will he be a king next season? As if he needed any other reasons to stay in L.A., he's got to come back to the zone. He only got halfway to the game's 43-goal record. With a restaurant bar. <laughs> I was having dinner and he was drinking. <laughs> I was trying to pick up on her. She wasn't interested. So we got married in the church that Luke's grandparents did? Yeah. And, and your parents? parents? Yeah. Yeah. So it's pretty special. <laughs> Welcome back to the ESPN Zone with Luke Robitaille. Luke, they keep cheering out there. That's you with your wife, Stacia, and we showed earlier your yeah. sons. Uh, 
Stephen and Jesse, mm -hmm. do you anticipate that we're going to see the next line of robotized in the NHL someday? Uh, I don't know. I mean, there's no way to know a kid at that age, you know. I mean, I, you know, I'm letting them be who they want to be, and uh, if they love the game, they're going to go practice. I mean, they got a roll of ring in their backyard, you know. If right. they love the game, they're going to go practice on their own, and you can't, you can't push them. If there's one thing, you know, I got to be thankful of my dad, is he never pushed me. My brother and I had our chance to play hockey, and I'm the one that wanted to go through all the skating, power skating hockey school. I'm the one that practiced every day outside. Nobody ever ever had to push me. I, so I feel the same way with my kids. I'm just going to let them be who they want to be, and uh, and then I'll, I'll help them that way. I always tell them that they're lucky, that they're fortunate enough that I can help them in any way they want to go because we're lucky of a lifestyle we live. But on, on what they want to do, I'd rather them to play baseball, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> well, in addition to the hockey rink, you've got a menagerie at your house. <laughs> Did Stacia know she was marrying a sheep herder? Tell us the story, the famous story. Barry Melrose wouldn't let me get away with it if I didn't ask you about the sheep from when you well, were playing uh, with the kids. Well, uh, that was in 92. Uh, we, we moved to in, the, in, the, in a country house uh, down in the valley, and uh, we had like a big lot. And uh, So, you know, thinking I would do all the great things for my kids and thinking I was a farmer suddenly because everybody had horses and animals. I thought, you know, we'll get a horse and I'll learn, but I, I was so scared of the horse. And then I thought... I'll get a couple sheep and I got a couple miniature goats and we even got a pot belly pig and uh, you know thinking I'm the farmer I knew exactly what to do and I you know the first thing I didn't do when this the summer came I, I didn't I didn't uh, shave the the sheep so by the middle of the summer in the valley it was like 105 108 degrees and the wool was like this long. I mean, it was so long that it was a split down the middle, like hair, you know, <laughs> like it was split. So I'm working in the backyard with my friend, and, you know, I got my boots and my, you know, my overalls and the whole thing. I think I'm this farmer. And I look at my, my buddy says, hey, look at the sheep. I think there's a problem with you, sheep. And, and we can see the sheep's kind of looking, just like staring at us, which it would never do that. And it, it looks, it goes right down the middle, and they go, falls right on the side it, it overheated we thought it died right there <laughs> just overheated so we had to bring the hose and just hose it down then we had to drag the sheep in the shades i mean but it I, lived it lived and then right. then i got a shave i didn't do it <laughs> all right well that's that's the important part of the story when we continue with luke robitaille will he stay in la whether he remains a sheep herder or not Free agency is impending. We'll take your viewer questions, including that top, when we continue up close. Up Close is a presentation of ESPN, the worldwide leader in sports. For more, log on to ESPN.com. They are turning out in force for Luke, and those of you who join us on the internet have these questions for Luke Robitaille. Steve from out here in South Pasadena wants to know, what do you think is missing for the Kings to make a true run for the Stanley Cup, and will you be missing next year? <laughs> well, I think, the, 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 if you ask me my, my honest opinion, I think signing our guys that played this year, and me included, <laughs> and... Uh, and then I think one forward, one top forward, you know, preferably probably a top centerman and a, and a defenseman. If we get that, I mean, especially the way we played the last 25 games, we tasted it. We know now we're this close. And, and I mean to compete with the top teams in the league, like the, the Jersey, the Colorado, the Dallas on a day-in and day-out basis. If we're ever able to, to get those two guys and, and get everybody that was together last year, I think we'd be like a top team in the league. And that's, that's what I want to do. I mean, I... I I feel we can win the cup the way we're set up and the way we're working if we do that. Well, let's take you back to the closest the team has come. Jim Cox in Scottsdale, Arizona wants to know, do you think Barry Melrose will ever coach again in the NHL? I don't know. I hear he makes a lot of money. So I don't know if he wants to give that up. <laughs> I don't know. If, I don't know. I think he seems very comfortable there behind, but he certainly will be a great coach if he ever de decides to coach again. You owe me, Barry, for saying that. <laughs> i got about 90 seconds left. Two quick ones. One, speaking of free agency, and you hope to stay, and they hope to keep you. Yarm Yager, it sounds like, is not staying yeah. in Pittsburgh. What are the chances you think he'll become an LA, uh, LA King? Uh, I, I don't know. I don't know what the situation is, but he's, uh, he's the best player in the world right now. You know, no doubt everybody knows it. So any team that gets Yager is going gonna, is gonna to change, is going to become a top team. And, he, you know, what he brings to a team is, he's, like I say, it's like, it's like when Shaq came here, you know, and suddenly this, this organization changed again from what they were in the 80s. So 
any team that gets Jagger is, is definitely going to be a different team. They'll be one of the top teams in the league. One more quick one before I get your pick on the Abs and uh, the, mm -hmm. the Devils. Any chance Rob Blake becomes a king again? You know, as I said, we needed a defenseman, didn't I? Yeah. <laughs> it would be great. I mean, it's certainly, uh, it would make our team. I mean, anybody, it's same situation. Probably the top free agent this summer is Rob Blake, of all the free agents. So whoever gets Rob Blake, you know, if, if he stays in Colorado or, or so forth, it's going to be a top team, too. i got 30 seconds left, Luke. Forsberg, in all likelihood, will not play at all in this series. Who do you like? Roy against Brodeur, Avs, Devils. Who's going to win the Stanley Cup? You know, I, they're the two top teams in the league. Those two teams make, made all the efforts to be where they're at. I mean, I, uh, you know, down deep because of Ray Borg, because of Rob, I, I hope uh, Colorado wins. But if you look on paper, you know, I would say Jersey has the advantage. Now, on the ice, it never shows that way. And the reason I say that is because they're missing Peter Forsberg. And to play the top teams in the league, you know, I mean, Sackick's playing unbelievable. And, but they have three great lines in Jersey, even four great lines. And... Both goalies are equal, you know, their defensemen are just about the same, and they're just missing one of their key players, and it comes down a lot of times to injuries on who's going to win or lose. Well, we know where your heart is in that series, and you know your heart is out here in LA. It's a pleasure to have you up close. We're off on Thursday. We're back with you on Friday with another L.A. theme. We'll get you ready for the WNBA with Michael Cooper and Lisa Leslie of the L.A. Sparks. We'll talk about the upcoming season and also about the team's decision to market to the local lesbian community. Join us at 5.30 Eastern on Friday. I'm Gary Miller at the ESPN Zone in Anaheim. Stay tuned. Sports Center's up next.